everybody. Welcome to another uh, episode of Tuzamen. Hi, Tzipi. Hi, Tzillian. Thank you for coming. Hi, Bill. Bill Barclay. You know, uh, two or three weeks ago, there was an outstanding um, uh, article about your, your show at the New York Times. Not many good things get good reviews in the New York Times lately. Not on... Uh, I, uh, not on the cultural uh, basis, not on political basis. It's really very gloomy to to go through the papers. But you got a good one. Unfortunately, it was only once and we didn't see it. But I did ask you to come because if it's so great, we have to know about it. So we're talking about um, um, music theater, right? And Bill, tell us who you are, what you do, and let us and then I want share to enjoyment a little bit with us in tough days. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so it, the, the piece is called The Chevalier. It's the life and music of Joseph Boulogne, Chevalier de Saint-Georges, who is uh, the first major Black composer, but he was also the best fencer in France, a knight of the king. Um, first general of the first black regiment in European military history and abolitionist. And his story was completely unknown to history. And I, I first found out about him in 20, 2018 and was embarrassed at what, what, why I didn't know about him as a, an early music specialist. I, at that time, I was director of music at Shakespeare's Globe in London, where I was for the better part of nine years. I, we brought a couple of productions over to Broadway, Farinelli and the King, your audience may know, uh, the Mark Rylance shows, Twelfth Night, Image of the Third. And, and so I was focusing a lot on early music and historical performance. And then this guy jumped out and, you know, he died in 1799. He's squarely in the early music canon and his music is fabulous. And I thought, what's the problem here? Well, of course, because he's mixed race. And as an artist of color, he was forgotten by history. And I, I didn't immediately think I would want to create myself a piece about him. I'm white, first of all, but I brought it to the Globe and I said, we have our new music story to tell here. And they passed. And then I asked two playwrights of color I knew and they passed. And, and then I thought, well, this is ridiculous. So I started asking major orchestras who I had worked with and said, why have you guys never played the excellent music of Joseph Ballone? And the Boston Symphony, who had commissioned several works from me in the past, I make works of concert theater. That's the name I call my works. There's it's story and music. I put actors in front of the orchestra or puppets or film or dance, but anything that brings new audiences in the door because audiences are dwindling in concert music all over the world, particularly post pandemic. And so I said, why haven't you made played the music of Joseph Ballone? And they said, well, we'll take something. And I said, well, you'll take what? And they said, well, we'll take a show if you want to make one. And, and then I thought, oh, geez, uh, can I do that? And they said, well, you, we can give you a date in six weeks at Tanglewood, which is the sort six of Hollywood weeks. Bowl of the East Coast. Yes. Oh, my the God. The Summer Home of the Symphony yeah, and the Berkshires. And I just thought, oh, God, uh, I had that same reaction you had. Yeah, and about a deadline. Uh, yeah, totally. In six months, I had to produce a show. And I had to Listen, researching. when you were given a date, you take it. Doesn't matter what. <laughs> Look, a deadline, as you both probably know is the most helpful thing in the world. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and so I had a show and I cast uh, several actors and Chakudi Awuji, the, um, who plays the villain in the new Guardians of the Galaxy movie, who's now a Marvel comic superhero. He was my first Joseph Ballone. In 2019, we had a sold out house and the response from the audience was euphoric, not necessarily for the work I'd made, although I think it, it, it apparently did work, but because they were euphoric that that they were learning about this guy who was marginalized and he deserved to be brought back into the light. And so since that moment, we 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 started selling this production to orchestras, saying this is the life, his story, and 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 his fabulous music superimposed on each other. And the the story talks about his music and his developments in, in the violin writing that he pioneered at the time because he was a virtuoso violinist as well as a composer. And and then of course in 2020 George Floyd died, and that that summer where we all started to completely reconstitute our relationship to race in this country and to some extent the world, that's when orchestras came to their senses and realized they had a huge problem, and we had the piece already made, and so we started getting phone calls saying, can you bring it here? Can you bring it there? And anyway, fast forward to now, 
we brought it to 12 orchestras and oh. including the London Philharmonic, you know, on tour in the UK. And we had a finally had our New York City debut two weeks ago at the United Palace in a sumptuous 3,300 seat venue in Upper Manhattan. We had 1,500 people there, 500 people of color, which for classical music is extraordinary. And and that review that you saw. So it's been quite the journey. Yeah, I, I must tell you, I, I must make a confession. So when she told me you are coming, I was like, wow, because I graduated Academy of Music and my granddaughter, uh, she's 15, uh, she played the piano and uh, she really sees herself as a pianist, professional pianist. And for me, you know, going to concert, you know, I see that there are not many young people even wherever I go. And this really upset me for many, many years. So when I heard that you were able to generate response and audience, which is not like 50 and up, and I'm kind of nice already, because mostly it's more like 60, I think, and up. Uh, I was so happy because I still co not completely know how can we bring the audience uh, you know, to young people to right. be more, more comfortable with, it's not only classical music, um, but modern music, because what you did, it's actually, I didn't, I have to listen to it because I didn't get the material yet. So the music, where do you put it? Because uh, like, it's a classical. It's what you find the video. Yeah, I know. So it's, I couldn't detect what we are talking about, classical music, uh, Baroque. What what this music that you showed me, because uh, it, it is different. Yeah, so Balon lives in uh, the, the this early classical style that sounds a little bit like Haydn and Mozart. Yes, okay, okay. But it's called the Gallant style. It's grand. It's French. Uh, it's it's beautiful. It's it's well proportioned. Like comedy, like, it, like, like the comedy de la arte. No, gallant. Um, gallant is a, a French word. We say gallant in 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 English, which is which is a word we incorporate from the French, which means the same thing. But it's not it's not comedia. It's early classical. So it's 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 after the Baroque period. Okay. okay. And it's it's after Bach and, and Handel. And it's 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 just before um, Beethoven takes off, but it's not Viennese music. It's not German music. It's French music, and so it has an air and a delightfulness and a playfulness and a and a showoffiness and a joie de vivre that is its own style. And that style would have become more famous were it not for the French Revolution and then the Napoleonic Wars that completely cut off the development of the center of the musical world at the time, which was Paris. You know, and now we think of, we classical music lovers think of the classical music as being so German centric, you know, the, the, the five most played composers in the world are all German speakers, Mozart, Beethoven, Bach, Brahms, Handel, Haydn, mm -hmm. um, Wagner, they're all German speakers. But in, in 1780, when Boulogne was really at his height, Everyone wanted to be at the Paris Opera. Everyone wanted to be in France, to be seen there, to have mistresses there, to eat there, to get their music performed there. And then the revolution completely changed the course of history. And we've forgotten that that gallant style was the high, was the haute couture of, of the musical life at that time. And Boulogne, this black guy, was at the very wow, center of it. He was amazing. at the peak of it. He was the one they all wanted to be. It's, it's amazing. So how but come he, like, he was away for so long? I mean, in terms of his, no, nobody knew about him. How can it be? Because it's so, you know, when I looked at the clips you sent, uh, it is very playful. It is very appealing. It is very like, uh, you know the fashion show, the music which makes you want to dance, right? In a way, it's charming. It's charming, exactly. And you're right that the music comes from these dance styles. But he's writing in sonata form. He's writing totally in line with his idols at the time, which was Haydn. He loved Haydn, 
and Paris was crazy about Haydn and Haydn's music is so well proportioned has such a sense of humor has such a sense of surprise and charm I mean this is what we're talking about is just charm it you you fall into it and so when I when I got to know his whole um oeuvre his whole output and of course many of the works are not recorded because his the publishing is a mess with Bologna the race Racism here extends all the way down into the ability just to hear the music online, to stream it, to read it. And I was in touch with the Bibliothèque Nationale Française to get microfiche, just to see some of the original autograph manuscripts that weren't recorded because I thought, I really want to present the very best of this man in this show. I want to fillet the best movements. And I took the best movements that I thought were the highest quality and I cut them and re rearranged them into just these theatrical packs so that I could turn them into sort of theater music that still gave integrity to his, his identity without sacrificing it. It's not like I cut it up into 30 second cues. There are big seven and eight minute movements in my show that allow the music to breathe and allow his personality to come to the fore. But that of course is the nature of my work. I concert theater, is, is an attempt to not sacrifice either for the other. It, uh, let me just explain that for a second. In the theater, you have live music sometimes. Most of it's canned, of course. But when you do, the musicians are in the pit, in a different room, right. you know, up there with keyboard instruments, filling in for string sections, out of sight, out of mind. They don't have to memorize because you're never going to bring them down onto the stage. And this creates a class system among the artists in the show. It's a caste system, really, where the musicians are there to serve the actors. Right. Now, in, in opera, the other example, you have story completely cleaving to, way, to make way for the enormous demands of the score. And so we go to opera not to, not to really to get us good story anymore. That's not why we go to right. opera. We, we get the opposite. The story. Every, yeah, you get um, the amazing music, but... But opera singers are becoming better actors. But again, that's not the point. The story and the narrative are secondary. Right. Okay. Right. And if you try to put music and story on the same footing, you, you just don't see it that often. And in musical theater, you can get that. You can achieve that in musical theater. But, it, but that's not classical music. It's, it's something different. And for those of us who love high art music, who love, you know, true classical music and what music can do, you know, the, the idea of having actors and orchestra both visually in the same visual field, but given equal time playing off each other, what this used to be called in the 19th century was melodrama. Right. Mm -hmm. the wor our word melodramatic came from an actual genre that didn't mean sentimental. It meant actors speaking to music because you know all those you know, booth productions of Shakespeare in the United States in the 19th century and Mendelssohn's Midsummer Night's Dream and you know Ibsen and Grieg's Peer Gynt this was theater with a full orchestra on stage and there were amazing scores where the, the best composers in the world would try to illuminate this text from within and some of that created some of those scores outlived the plays that they served it, Per Gint is a great example. We know that music much more than we know what happened in the Ibsen story that it was written for. Right. And mm -hmm. so my desire to sort of bring people back into live performance is to give them a story that they actually can appreciate. So the, with where do you generate Not the stories? Do you use that, sorry? Original, Where do you generate? Do you use story, a okay. plays or you just uh, take an original uh, text? What do you usually do? How do you? I do both. Okay. I do both. So in the Chevalier, I wrote. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, in in the Chevalier, I wrote a play out of whole cloth from the research. The characters are Mozart, Marie Antoinette. Joseph Ballone, Chevalier Saint George, and Chaudhary de la Clos, who wrote Dangerous Liaisons, they they dictate parts of his life. I take real world events and I write the dialogue from nothing. In the case of Per Gint, which I've set, which goes up March seven, eight, nine at the Boston Symphony, um, I I took Gibson's play and I adapted it. I I didn't cut it. I I just rewrote it, but I used his characters and his story. 
uh, with the Mendelssohn Midsummer Night's Dream, which I've set with orchestra, I use the Shakespeare, but I trim it in a way that allows it to serve alongside the music in a in a in a beautiful way. And so each each project requires me to take a slightly different plan okay. of attack, if you like. Tell me something. Uh, two two things I want to ask you. How come is that we know that uh, some of a uh, why let's say Bach 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 how do you call Bach Bach how do you Bach, call it? Yep. Uh, is much people don't maybe know the name but they know the music because a lot of modern Sorry, you, 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 you modern singers are using Bach and they do you know like uh, improvisation and they create the, so the music of Bach uh, the, people don't know that it's Bach but they know the music because so many singers adapted Bach music to their you know even pop or uh, or even rock right so why why mm -hmm. not him how come nobody picked him up except why him? not Bach why, why did no one set Bach no what you know like like well, the same I... way people take Bach and they make new music out of it they use Bach but they do improvisations and they give oh, me I see. you're asking why they didn't do that with Joseph alone no, oh. I think what she's asking, basically, I think what Bill is doing, he's using the original score, the original music, and then he puts it together with text that he's choosing and he's elevating like he's creating a whole scene of a concert plus drama and bring ver variety of audiences to enjoy both. That's so you get some happens. young people coming? Some younger yeah, audience? so the yeah, so so uh, let me back up a second. So I left the Globe and I founded Concert Theater Works, which is a nonprofit aimed at um, bringing new audience into classical music. So we build new audiences for organizations. We sell the works that I've made, and I've written fifteen projects so far. We sell them to orchestras all around the world. We travel there. We bring the actors, and in a couple of rehearsals, we take the show out of the box and we mount a, a big spectacle for them. We help them advertise that, and they use that to bring people in the door for the first time. Wow. That's the problem. And we, we've discovered that orchestras around the world need, desperately need yeah. to build in audiences. Of course. And it's not, it's not that you need to pull the people in who, during the pandemic, are too afraid to come back. You know, pe pe the, a lot of those people are never going to come back, but you, you you have to appeal to young people every single day because yes. that's the audience. That's your subscriber base for the future. And we've just discovered that a lot of them don't know how to do that. The, the big ones don't need to because they've got these big endowments and, you know, they're, they're, they'll survive any old thing. But it's the regional orchestras and choruses around the country that are dying like our regional newspapers are, our local yeah. newspapers. And they're really on a knife's edge in terms of surviving, not all of them, but many of them. And they need fresh thinking. They need something in the brochure or something on the website that makes people look at it and go, oh, I, I want to see that. It has to be and attractive, the, yeah. And the prevailing solution for this in the last 10 years has been um, live film, mu live film with 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 well, mu film with live music. I should say right. so, so a Harry Potter movie, and they'll have someone conducting the orchestra playing it, and that has worked some in some ways, but it's very expensive. The rights for the film are very expensive, and when you turn the lights down on the orchestra and you put a big screen in front like that we entrain to a film modality and we forget that the orchestra is there at all. We're watching Jaws and we hear the music, which is great, but we're not appreciating the musicians for the incredible work that they're doing, interpreting for us live. And the musicians feel that. And so they're playing in the darkness. There was Stan Lights, these long notes. You know, it's not like the beautiful Mozart they used to playing. They're playing this cinematic music and they don't feel loved and they don't feel centered or platformed in their own house. And, and so they're it's, not it's not. They're not. They're, they're not. not. We're not. It's like in musicals, they're not performing. They just serve the performers. And here you, you they become a part of the whole show, which is nice. So you do you yeah. generate a talent, young talent, uh, for those shows, like for all I, the aspects of it. 
I typically just hire my friends, to be entirely honest. Um, <laughs> uh, I used okay. to I used to criticize people for hiring their friends, and now I know why they do it. Uh, um, you, I it's need easy, people, and like, if they're talented, it's it's just fun. It's wonderful. Exactly, exactly. And it, these gigs are strange for actors. They've got a hundred musicians playing right into their back while they have to time this thing. And it takes real act of boldness. And I really have to, I need their trust and they need to trust me in order for everyone to feel like it's going to work. And, you know, the, the break rules are different than equity. And, right. you know, it, it's a different experience. And typically they only have a couple days of rehearsal and they only perform mm -hmm. it once or twice. It's not a standard gig. And, and so I need people. But I was wondering much. how much rehearsal time. But, but how do you how do you break the how do you build the the dialogue between the drama and the music between the actors and the orchestra? My formula for most of these pieces is in thirds. I like to have a third of the the piece have the orchestra play on its own. Oh. I like I like to have a third of the piece have the actors speaking on their own. And then I like to have a third of the piece where, where they're doing it together. Very smart. Wow. That's See, very smart because you, you start to develop the way you listen. And then when they're together, you already are part of this dialogue. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It, well, it's, it's worked so far. It's been a lot of trial and error. But that means that everyone is working for two thirds of the show. And right. so everyone feels like it's about them. And that's really key okay. is I have to make the orchestra feel like they're still the protagonist in this story. I care about them. And we also, they're, the, they're, they're writing our check. They're inviting us back. And we've had experiences where I've written scripts and the orchestra feels like they don't play enough. And it's, it's, it's sad because I love them. Right. Um, and it's not about diminishing them. It's actually about the opposite. It's about celebrating them. Um, so it's it's a delicate balance to strike. I understand why other people don't make work like this. Because I think it's just a representation of what I want in the world, which maybe is rather specific. But it's also my skill set. I am a musician and I'm also a theater person, kind of 50-50. And so my works reflect that. That's amazing. It's like a completely new voice. But, you know, Celia and me saw uh, a Ibsen, Dollhouse 2. Dollhouse number 2. Number 2. And so he took the play and it didn't change the play, but he started from the no, it, end of the play, he but continued. Changed the... He continued yeah. the play. He, and then he it started like from the end of the, the when, original when play lives. and he created a whole new yeah, play. Yeah, but then of course he put the uh, African-American actors and characters. And no, this is the politically correct of the... Well, the but politics. this is what he did. And I just want, was wondering when I asked you, where do you take your text? So how much you rely um, on the original? You know, like you, I think you are. And the question, is it conventional to take like Shakespeare and change it or improvise on it? Is it, is it, is it, is it, I mean, it's it part of the convention? Hmm. It's theater convention. It's conventional. It's conventional to cut Shakespeare. Okay. It's it's not not conventional to rewrite it, but I don't really rewrite it. If if I'm deal, you know, I did a big Antony and Cleopatra production at the Hollywood Bowl, and at uh, the Barbican in London, and then at Virginia Symphony. So we toured that, and that was a big show, you know, out in that big seventeen thousand seat venue and everything, and LA Philharmonic and things. And it, and I, I trimmed the play. I really cut it. It was like I was making sushi out of the play. I mean, little <laughs> tiny pieces of fish everywhere, you know, and putting it over measures of the music for an hour and a half. And it was an, an enormous challenge to achieve. It, there are moments when a word that Shakespeare uses is not going to land for the audience in a critical moment. And in a play, when you're seeing the whole play, these these moments like the word frenzied for example we don't know what the word frenzied means it appears in measure for measure about eight times and we have no idea what the word means today in the play it provides gristle like in a gristle and a piece of meat it's good to chew on something else because it 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 makes you more intelligent you go what does that word mean and that curiosity can inspire a lot of critical thinking in your brain but when you're when you're making bite-sized chunks of shakespeare 
for the orchestra, you toss out a big word at a key moment that the audience has no chance of understanding what it is. I will re rewrite that word. And I'll, I'll put in a word that doesn't, doesn't betray the scansion, keeps the scanning of Shakespeare alive. I know what he's trying to do. I've studied him for two decades. No, but you have, so you keep the meaning. I mean, you don't change. I keep the, the, the meaning. concept is so there. The concept is there. It's just an easier way to hand it to a new audience to make friendly with something that they Yeah, but you know, but in on. adaptation, it's a form of, a, form but of it's adaptation. adaptation. It is. It's a form of adaptation in, in a, a way. Way. And the question how, and I'm sure yeah. that you stick to the soul of the piece. You of don't, course. you know. Yes. The core yes. is there, yes. but it's a playful. It's playful. Yeah, but the question is the original text. The original text is in the play. With he, here, he's playing with the original text to serve his meaning, giving the idea of the story, make it easier and more fun. Yeah, but and clearly still... there is a big debate about what do you do when adapt. But I think he is keeping. What's important is you can change everything. You can change scenes. You can change character. Is even as long as you keep to the soul of the piece. The question is really. Now let me let me. Give... Because when you have when you have uh, responsibility for the theater or for original writing or big you know classical playwright, the question is whether you let them stay as they are forever and ever, or you say you know what times are different, or I like it a little bit different, or I would like to bring it to people that would never come and see you. Let me play with this a little bit without hurting you, just I'm creating something else. And then you basically check if over time you see if it's working or not, if it did what you wanted or not, if you should go back to the original or not. It's just testing. So what's your take, what's your take on using other people's text and do whatever you do in terms of adaptation? You, you understand my question? Well, I'll tell you. Can you repeat what you asked again? Sorry. Yeah, I'm trying to see, you know, it's almost like two different approaches between me and Silly. I think I, I say you can change everything as long as you keep to the soul of the piece. I think when Silly was yes, talking, no, 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 no. is whatever you like it or you don't like it, the it's core, nothing to do with no, liking it or no, not. No, you're wrong. The core of the piece is the core of the piece. Okay. The story is the story. The way of handing the story is different the thing is that the what you i think referring to if it's allowed to play with the original uh story and adapt it in a way that is not you're not used to it or over time to see if it's really working but, but if you know... get people to sit and enjoy it and you know uh, shakespeare that was written 100 years ago we can maybe taste it differently, you know, when it comes to these days. It doesn't mean that you heard Shakespeare. It just you present Shakespeare to new generation that maybe will go to the original one then later on. Somebody can carry it too far. That's right. And I got to tell you, it's very, very hard to hurt Shakespeare. That man is as durable as they get. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you where I land on this, 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 this difference of opinion between the two of you, which I don't actually think is that different. I think you're saying very similar things. But... Um, I'm very pragmatic about this question. I'm not holy about it at all. And my barometer is the more famous a work is, the less you can change it because people scream. And if you, if they don't, you can't really change much of to be or not to be, that is the question, that right. speech. If you're gonna present that on stage in any setting, a concert or whatever, you can make a judicious pruning towards the end, but the, the famous bit has to stay, or you will actually it's distract there. the audience from the story. Right. They'll be taken out of it. They'll be taken out, they'll be like, yeah. but wait a minute, and you, you want them in it. So, yeah. but if you if you were doing something like Antony and Cleopatra, where people don't have, know a quote from that show readily, you can kind of do whatever you want. You can do whatever keeps the soul, as you say, intact, and also allows you to serve your mission which is to which is to fish for new people who go oh my god Shakespeare I did never I never got it before and now I get it okay you know I just want to point that um I don't really know how is it in the states or in Europe but in Israel and you can 
correct me if I'm wrong, uh, in the theater, from my experience, the actors can change the lines. It's, not a... No, it's not that the actors can change the line, just they sometimes do it without, uh, without permission. Without permission. That's the thing. The rules in in Israel in the Israeli theater are looser than let's say on Broadway on Broadway you get a set of rules you have you boxed in you go in and you have to obey otherwise you cannot be there and the the self um discipline is very strong because if you don't do it you won't be there in Israel like many other things in Israel you do like this you do what you it's want and it's 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 very wrong so this is another story because it's not changing the play when it's written it's doing what you want on stage and uh, it, it happens here and there and it's loosened up in in so many ways um but it this is the Israeli culture this is the Israeli culture like mm. you no know, you know the people on stage they know you you have it's a it's a very loose a very loose uh, uh, experience what you're doing it's a totally different story because once the the production on stage you have to follow exactly what you say and it's just that you bring it in a different way that's it yeah and if you can bring new audiences mm. so most of the audience that comes to the shows are the permanent audience the subscribers of the specific orchestra or you bring they, new they bring new ones, new audience. It depends. So, uh, when we go with big orchestras like Per Gint in Boston coming up, it's their audience and they don't need the help. We've, we've offered the help, but they, they don't need it. They, they know how to bring in their people. Uh, and it's their commission. They commissioned the piece back six years ago. In the case of the United Palace, the Chevalier that we just did, there was no audience built in for that at all. And I had to get almost every single person uh, we had major advertising. I wrote easily over a hundred personal emails hmm. to individuals that I knew and I didn't. I was in touch with about 30 different nonprofit organizations wow. to try to see how to get them to come. Can we get on your newsletter? Do you need brochures? You know, you know, can I come and speak at your local church can you tell people to listen to this radio interview that's going on do people need free tickets do people need a discount code you know does anyone need a comp who, who can advocate for this and it was a partnership between schools wow. like maybe some people left to help like LaGuardia High School for example sure. they went yes yeah we want to send the whole school there and they, and sure. they end up sending 200 people to the show um, but this but then most of audience. which you know most yeah this is building a new audience, audience but it's specific like Guardia High School is known for that. Did you think ever to find uh, I don't know uh, no to go to the bottom line? Do you see like a piece of your show being performed in the Grammy? You know what we had last night the Grammy Award at the Grammys. Can you imagine if yesterday I would see a singer, um, two or three, uh, doing a section of what you are writing? I know it's it's kind of a... It's not a... Thing. I mean, I suppose it's possible. It would be great. What would be needed is something we're pivoting. Say it again? We, we, we're now starting to make work with living... We're, we're starting now to make work with living composers. I have a new project, project Musicophilia, set in the Oliver Sacks book, which is about music's healing and neurodivergent patients. And we'll have a new composer writing new work. And that's the kind of stuff that gets nominated for, for, for Grammys and things. But we're in classical music, and I don't suppose you saw much classical music on the Grammys last night. No. Right? But I'm trying to see how can we... Uh, there used to be a classical section. A new audience. But maybe, maybe with jugglers. Like what you did, <laughs> yeah. Like for example, in the style, maybe my juggling, day. yeah. In the style that you are working with, how about having a story about Ophelia? Yeah, I mean, I, I it, we, it would not, I, we'd love to be at the Grammys, but I, I, I don't see that being something a decision I can make. I think they sort of invite you if they if they find you topical and relevant enough. 
uh, it's about what people want to watch on television. The Grammys, all the award shows are about television. They're not about the awards. Everything is geared towards what's going to keep the viewership on the eyeballs so that they can ad advertise during the commercials. That's what that is. I, mean, I don't let's know not why I trust you that you can catch the audience. It takes time. It yeah. takes time. It's yeah, but he, time. but he saves even not considering it. And I'm saying, I send you there. Why it's so important? Hey, look, if you can get us, well, I mean, I mean, Ram is just an example. But anyway, I wish, I wish, because I always, you know, I'm like, since I am maybe 24, 25, which was yesterday, I was asking the question, how do we bring audience, young audience to classical music? I was really dealing with it. And I, but I'm so happy that you are really doing things that are in the right direction. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Bill, thank you for coming and sharing this with us. Um, and good it's luck. It's a new with notion. It's really something new that people don't know about. So that's why he's here. Well, for your viewers, for the viewers, um, the Chevalier is it was video was uh, taped and is now being streamed for the next two weeks. So for the ah, next okay. two weeks until February eighteenth, you can go to mba1800.org, which is the Music Before eighteen hundred website. And uh, I'm artistic director there. It's a New York concert. If you can series. write, send us this link so we can put and it. We'll and we'll put it on. Yeah. Yep. And you can watch it. And it's I watched it the other day to proofread it. It's excellent. And it's a really good capture of what we did. So Wonderful. so thank you both so much. And hope and Celia hope. I will to, I will to send the link to my students at NYU. Great. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. Thanks, CP. Ah, thank, thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody. You. See you next week. Yeah.